From the television studios of the Jack J. Valenti School of Communication at the University of Houston, this is the Discovery section of Graffiti, the electronic newsletter of the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences. My name is John David Powell. The pairing of faculty and student researchers provides opportunities for our students to work alongside top researchers in their fields. This month, we'll visit with one of those teams. Martha Dunkelberger is an assistant clinical professor in communication sciences and disorders. She joined the university in 1997 after eight years of clinical practice. Her interest is in developing a better understanding of the developmental progression of phonological systems and literacy skills in preschool and school-aged children. Sarah Panjwani is a senior comedy major who is part of the Summer Undergraduate Research Fellowship Program in the Honors College. She and Professor Dunkelberger are assessing the knowledge of Houstonian speech language pathologists regarding the evaluation of culturally and linguistically diverse students in efforts to improve those students' quality of education. And we want to first thank Bank of America, Sarah, for letting you uh, come in today. Uh, I know that you had a, a job this summer, and uh, is it a summer job or a regular job? Or? It's a regular job. Well, <laughs> and, and, uh, and they let you off to come in and, and be with us for today. So mm -hmm. thanks to them, and thank you for showing up. So that is a mouthful, the knowledge of <laughs> assessing the knowledge of Houstonian speech language pathologists regarding the evaluation of culturally <laughs> and linguistically diverse students and efforts to improve those students' quality of education. <laughs> okay. What does that mean? It, it came from um, one of Sarah's first questions about research when we were first discussing what she might want to do in her opportunities to develop a senior thesis. One of the things that she found interesting was that students in, who are culturally or linguistically diverse, like students who were in an elementary school who came from a different background culturally or a different background linguistically, they spoke more than one language and that language might or might not be English. Um, and so those students ended up in a situation where someone might interpret them as actually having a disorder rather than a difference in communication skills. And so Sarah's concern was if those students were labeled as disordered, then that meant that they were being pulled out of a classroom and treated as if they were disordered and missing valuable instruction time. And so Sarah's thought was that we wanted to make sure that we evaluated them a little bit more accurately and that the speech pathologists who are working in the public schools specifically at that point in time, mm -hmm. and that's the only way we were going at that point, but the, the therapists who are working in the public schools might be missing these students and actually misdiagnosing them. So Sarah and I um, and another professor in the, de in the department, uh, Rachel Agar Agara, who's been with us for just about a year now, She's in India for the summer. Um, but Rachel and Sarah and I decided that we wanted to look a little broader and look at the, the majority of the speech pathologists in Houston to see how many of them understood the difference between a person who had a diverse language ability versus a, a disordered language ability and to see if those um, pathologists knew where to go for more information, knew how to access better information, and knew how to distinguish between the disorder and the, and the difference. It would seem, Sarah, that that would be an easy thing to understand, uh, a stutter versus speaking Spanish. Uh, what, mm -hmm. what was the confusion? Well, there isn't always um, uh, the distinction between stuttering and a different language. It's not always as clear in other cases where um, perhaps there's a student who doesn't speak very much in class, but that might be just because they need more time to comprehend before they speak out in class compared to their fellow students because they speak another language and they're here from a different country um, trying to uh, get used to the newer environment, the, their peers, um, the new language that they're learning, um, and many times the new material that is coming towards them. So many students are perceived as, oh, um, that child might be slow, they might have some cognitive problems because um, they, they have a disorder, whereas um, they're, they just really have a difference in language and they just need some time to catch up to English and to where their peers are in English. See, to me that would sound more like a learning disorder rather than a, a speech disorder. So I'm, st I'm still kind of confusing of how someone would misdiagnose a speech disorder. Well, in many cases what's going to happen is the speech pathologist will be consulted with a, with a child who looks like he's learning differently because part of a speech pathologist's job in the schools is to identify whether this is an issue of a language function that the child doesn't seem to even understand the directions that the teacher is giving or if the child doesn't necessarily understand 
school or understand how to learn. Um, and language really infuses all parts of learning. Language is part of, of a math lesson, language is part of a history lesson, and language is part of a science lesson. It just all has to be infused there. So if a child has difficulty understanding language from a cognitive standpoint, then he's going to have a need for a speech language pathologist. One of the things that we have to consider when we're talking about people who come into a new education system from a different environment, from a, a foreign country, or speaking a language from home that they hadn't been exposed to English when they come into the schools, is that it takes approximately seven years for a person to be really confident enough to learn a language well enough and to use a language well enough to learn in it. Um, we have two different levels and lots of research has shown that there's a, a level where, that we refer to as BICS, which is basic intercommunications, interpersonal communication skills. And that BICS level of communication is the easy stuff. That's when the teacher says, I chew, and the kids all go, bless you, Mrs. Smith. That's the easy communication. And if they can do that, that's no big deal. But the trouble is, is that we really expect kids to be able to learn in this language, not just be able to say bless you when they need to. Mm. So they need to have a higher level, what we call the cognitive academic learning or language proficiency. And if they can have that CALP level of communication, then they're going to be fine. But that takes a long time to develop. BICS is easy. I mean, anybody can get BICS. But it's really difficult to develop that CALP, and it takes a longer time. So these kids who are dropped into the schools at kindergarten not speaking any English are really going to struggle. And it may look like they're disordered um, because they can say, bless you. Boy, it looks like they're communicating fine. But then we realize that they're not learning well. So how long have you been conducting the research? Um, well, we uh, began. We began last November, mm -hmm. I think, to start um, developing ideas to uh, what would be the best way to start this off. So since, I guess since about November. Okay. Mm -hmm. Have you reached any preliminary conclusions? No, not yet. S still gathering the data. Still mm -hmm. gathering data. And this gathering is uh, throughout uh, Houston, uh, Houston Independent mm -hmm. School District mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what particular grade levels? Uh, or well, or th throughout uh, K through 12 or what? Yes, it's pretty much all grade levels. So yeah. what are you getting out of this? Um, the experience, basically. Uh, the research is starting to become more and more um, enjoyable. Uh, I guess once you get part past the really nitpicky stuff <laughs> and you get, you get the results, I think it's, um, you, you really get to see the difference that you've made and that um, the accomplishments. And what do you do? Do you go in and you sit down and, and, and visit with the speech, speech pathologists? And or is there questionnaires? Or I know you don't mm -hmm. have labs and beakers and, <laughs> and petri dishes. So what if do only you, how it were do you, that easy. How do you do it? <laughs> how do you do it? Uh, we've started by doing questionnaires and surveys mm -hmm. and, and looking at material from um, certain surveys that may have been done um, in other parts of the country in this area mm -hmm. to compare it. And we're delivering the surveys by um, internet. So we have uh, an access to a number of the speech language pathologists in the city of Houston, including some that are in the schools, but also some that are in an ECI program, an early childhood education program, or a, a program of geriatrics. Yeah, yeah. Bilingual and multicultural people exist in all other practices. So um, looking to see if speech pathologists in all sorts of areas of the practice will answer the surveys. And when mm -hmm. we get all that data back, we'll find out what they're doing. And have you found this to be widespread, or is it uh, limited in its scope? Or, uh, Clarify your question. Well, uh, is this a major problem? Are we, are we misdiagnosing a yes. lot of students? Yes, mm -hmm. we are. Yes, that is one of the areas that um, um, Education in general, not just speech language pathologists, but education in general has really kind of um, missed the boat in what happens when a person who is multilingual comes into a classroom and English may not be the strongest language. Um, um, in some cases, in, um, certainly in Houston, Houston's such a great diverse city, we have a lot of opportunity for folks. But um, and what might happen is if you have a child who speaks Urdu and then a child who speaks Chinese and a child, well, one of the dialects of Chinese and another child who speaks um, Persian, correct me if I'm, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but if you have those three children, well, there may not be a, a teacher who can speak each of those That's languages. True. So those children may all be in a classroom together with a, an English speaking teacher who is going to try to help them as best she can. And of course that teacher is going to be doing her very best, but there's going to be limits to what we can expect for those kids. And so that's one of the areas where we really still need to kind of grow and figure out what we need to do to improve that. Oh, great. Martha Dunkelberger and Sarah Penjwani, thank you for being with us and thank the folks at Bank of America <laughs> for giving you the time off to come in today and visit with us about uh, this research. And good luck to you with, on the research and uh, your senior year here at the University mm -hmm. of Houston. Thank, thank you again you. for being with us. Thank you. And thank you for being with us and we will see you next month.